Good. Metta Sutra. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, not busy with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be happy. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none show anger or ill will which harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the sky Outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to false views the pure hearted one having clarity of vision being free from all sense desires is not born again No questions. So, good night, everybody. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Bigger now. Okay, now this is so much. Now look at all this. So, well, that's much. <laughs> so now we have to start the rule that one question per person. No more than one question in the evening. One question. I this is not. The, this is private. One question, and when it means one question, 
It does not mean part A, part B, part C. <laughs> One question per person. Very good. Beautiful. <coughs> Here we go. I was in the middle of the beautiful breath today, blissfully enjoying the toing and froing of the increasingly quiet breath. When some members started whispering softly in the Dharma Hall, it was a, probably a case of me disturbing the, nurse, the noise rather than vice versa, but fact is, it was the end of whatever it might have been. Oh, whoever did that whispering, bad karma. <laughs> it's true, I mean, sometimes the people I do get very sensitive. That's why we're not supposed to whisper or make any noise in here. Especially in here, if you want to whisper, say, just go outside and whisper. Or write on a piece of paper. So could you, dear Ajahn, gently remind members that the meditation halls are so silent, you can sometimes hear a pin drop and the less skillful amongst us will start searching for the pin. Haha, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so please look after one another. No whispering in the hall. It's not good. If they, people don't know what's going on, they won't die. It's not the end of the world if you keep quiet. Thanks for the basic method of meditation notes distributed during this retreat. It's the very clear techniques of know-how, the know-how of meditation for beginners. I have read it many times. It is useful for my meditation. Very good. I was on this flight, on Garuda flight. I was actually going up to the last executive retreat. And it's a nice flight on Garuda because, first of all, I love telling this story, that the flight attendant stopped by my seat and looked at me. <laughs> and she said, are you Ajahn Brahm? I said, Last time I checked, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then she put her hand over her heart, said, I must be your biggest fan. I've read all of your books. <laughs> and so from then on I got very good treatments on the aircraft, first class treatment. But not only that, as soon as I confessed who I was, there's two Australian guys sitting next to me, you know, and economy class, I had the window seat too, and the one sitting next to me, in his carry-on baggage, a little bag, he pulled out a book, Basic Method of Meditation. <laughs> he said, I carry this everywhere I go. I'm going on holiday to Bali, and I carry it even there. So it is a very well-known book, and very famous. And I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, the guy sitting next to me, the flight attendant, I can't escape anywhere. <laughs> or as Angie told me, he said, Ajahn Brahm, please don't be naughty, don't do anything wrong, because everyone is looking at you now, you can't escape anymore. <laughs> I can't go incognito. <laughs> Not that I would ever do anything wrong. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I really enjoy my room. It is small but sufficient. I can be alone with myself. It is better than a hotel room because it's safe and peaceful. I do not lock my room. Can one stay a longer period, say three months or a year? One can meditate on their own. You can stay a whole lifetime. <laughs> but it will cost you your hair. <laughs> Very good. Now seriously though, uh, we, there is actually a rule, a law from the council. You can't stay longer than three months. That's a maximum. That was in the approval. Because otherwise it's, uh, it's a long-term residence rather than a short-term residence. A different sort of uh, law. But what many of you can do, and I encourage this, you can do what we call self-retreats. Those self-retreats at a time when there's not an organized retreat on like you know, these next few days. When there's no retreat organized, we have all these rooms in the cottages free, and people come and do what's called self-retreat. So there's no teachings, there's no morning chanting or talks, and look, you have read, eno read enough books, heard enough talks, and if you really, really, really want to talk, you know, you get on the smartphone, download heaps, and you can listen to those. But what you do, you look after yourself in your room, and you just make your own breakfast, you know, either in the kitchen or in your room. There's lots of stuff you can take from the kitchen for your own breakfast. And you walk over to Bodhinyana for lunch. 
and then you walk back again, the rest of the day is all yours. And that's what we call those self-retreats, and those are available for people. We want people to have done a nine-day retreat first of all, so that we know who they are, they're not crazy people. <laughs> or what happened for one retreat, a guy came here with his girlfriend. <laughs> it wasn't the sort of retreat which I would encourage. <laughs> <laughs> just hanging out together. So a nice weekend with your girlfriend, free without any cost and just... So we know, have to know that you're here to meditate and be quiet. So uh, if you do that, then fine, you can do these self-retreats. And that's, you know, you check up on, usually on our website down here, they say when the retreats are on, so you find a time between those organised retreats and you do your self-retreats. And so that's great, which means you know, you've got a bit of free time either a holiday between jobs or whatever, and you just come over here, just uh, ring up Daniel and make sure that you know, you're well known, uh, you've got my permission, you say you've been on a BF retreat before, and now Daniel will just check that she knows you, and I know you, and then you just come and you self-retreat. So it's a very beautiful facility for that. Dear Ajahn, we often hear you say that by following the Dharma, doing regular meditation and doing good, we we move towards enlightenment. I've also heard that we can only, only we can save ourselves, but I feel sometimes that this is a bit selfish. Why can't we also help others towards enlightenment? What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> Encourage them to meditate regularly or stop drinking and follow five people. So I feel guilty that I think of myself, I don't do enough to encourage others, especially when they are stubborn people with super egos and move deep into samsara. This is what you can do. You know, become a monk, become like me, and then you can help so many people. Or become a nun. So much more fun being a nun. They were even rhymes. Nun fun. <laughs> <laughs> So that way, you can actually help others. But even if you can't become a monk or a nun, you can help out at Brahm Centre or Buddhist Fellowship Centre. So you can actually serve and help others. So there's lots of things you can do. So there's many things you can do to help save others. So again, meditation is one thing, doing good is one thing, uh, it moves towards enlightenment, you can bring a lot of other people with you because you're doing some service. Hi Jan, if, I tra if transfer of merits is done for A who passed away and A reincarnates into B, does B re receive the transfer of merits? A, B, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course they do. They receive the merits. Look. You're always changing. Every morning you're a new person. But the person who ate the food yesterday still gets the energy today. So of course, merits are like that. If you do merit in a, for someone who passed away and they get reborn, of course they get the merits. How do we give caring attention to those thoughts that arise? Do we give it to the thoughts or the people in the thoughts? Everything, the people in the thoughts. So, okay, here we go. This is one of the great similes. You use this for so much in life and especially in meditation. The monster in the Emperor's Palace. I say this on every retreat, and I say this in conferences, and mental health conferences, you know, for people who've been raped, abused, people who are crazy. And it's powerful. You know that, I'll say it in brief, because I'm sure you've heard me say this many times, it's a key story in opening the door of your heart. I always repeat this, because it is a brilliant simile of the Buddha. Monster comes into Emperor's palace while Emperor is away, sits on the Emperor's throne. All the guards and the ministers, get out of here, you don't belong. And every unkind word, every unkind act, even unkind thoughts, the monster grows bigger, more ugly, more of a problem. And because you know, the emperor's away, let's change it. She is the wise one. Why don't we have female emperors? 
Even in the old days, remember Bodicea, she was the emperor of the Brits. Now when they were fighting the Romans, maybe that's why the Romans won. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I get into trouble. I don't mind being in trouble. <laughs> Makes life interesting. So anyway, uh, so <laughs> the empress, when she comes back, you know, this monster is huge, ugly, smelly, and my favourite description is it's so stinky that even the maggots crawling on the, the monster's skin, even the maggots threw up. <laughs> they vomited. <laughs> <laughs> and so, when the Empress came, she realised the mistake of everybody. This huge, ugly problem of a monster, the Empress, she came in and said, Welcome. Thank you so much for popping in for a visit. Has anyone got you something to drink yet? We can make you a cup of tea with condensed milk. <laughs> 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 we can make you some fish and chips. We can give you... <laughs> and they were so kind, this monster. That this monster, every kind act, kind deed or kind thought, the monster shrank a little bit. And everybody saw that, and they realised their mistake. Get out of here, you get into trouble if you stay, I don't want you, get out monster. That is what made the monster bigger, and more of a problem. They were feeling it anger. But once they gave it kindness, the monster got a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. And they just laid on the kindness so much, that soon the monster was back at the size when he, f he first came in. But they just carried on with the kindness. So much that soon the monster got so small, so tiny that one more act of kindness and the monster vanished totally away. And that, the Buddha said, is called an anger-eating monster. You feed it ill will and it gets bigger. So those of you who think that I'm fat, <laughs> you should feed me more kindness. <laughs> and then I get smaller, 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 smaller. <laughs> so be kind, more condensed milk, more fish and chips, more... <laughs> no, oh God. Anyway, <laughs> in that simile, I was only joking there. In that simile, that simile is powerful. When these poor people who've been subjected to rape and torture and terrible things, Get out of here, you don't belong. It gets worse. And when I mentioned to that to them, because they're in such a terrible situation with that memory, many of them actually they get it and they're so courageous they actually welcome the trauma. Say, welcome, come in. And it's amazing the transformation which happens. What well, was once a monster, a demon, you know, coming into their life gets smaller and smaller, and it, you see it when it's vanished. And that is impressive. Now that's with terrible things which have happened in the past. Get out of here, you don't belong. It gets worse, bigger and more of a problem. Thoughts in your mind, get out of here, you don't belong. What happened to those thoughts? They get worse. So instead you just say, welcome thoughts, thank you for coming. What do you want to think about? Now, for many of you, it's counterintuitive until you actually do it. But one of my, one of my key stories, I have to repeat these because you know, it's part of my upbringing, training, my experience. It was fifth year, sixth year, sorry, as a monk, beautiful monastery, absolutely perfect, and started thinking a lot. I was by myself, no other monks there at all, no teachers and the thoughts started going crazy. And you all know, I've told you personally, how much I love being a monk. Never ever, this is absolutely true, never ever wanted to disrobe, even even thought about it. I love being a monk. And, but this time I had all these sexual fantasies, memories of old girlfriends. I wonder if what she's doing now. I wonder if she's, ah, shut up, you're a monk. And the, all these thoughts came up 
And you know, I don't want the thoughts, I try to get rid of them. And they came up stronger and stronger. And I was by myself and I just could not get rid of it. I was fighting every minute of the day. And after a while I thought I was going crazy. You know when thoughts get so obsessive you can't stop them? And I didn't know what to do and just a bit of sort of intuition. I went to the Buddha statue. Every monastery has a Buddha statue. Bowed three times and just said, help. And the thought came up into my mind, an idea, a possible solution, was to do a deal. And the deal, the contract was, I would behave, my mind would just watch the breath and meditate like a good monk should for most of the day. But for 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. every afternoon was my sexual fantasy time. <laughs> Anything would go. And I wouldn't try and stop it at all. I wouldn't be embarrassed, old girlfriend say, that time you can do whatever you like. For the rest of the day you behave. And that's what I thought. And <laughs> I, you know, when I make a promise I keep it. That's how I've been trained by Ajahn Chah. That's why sometimes when you ask me, can you come here, can you go there, I sometimes say, I'll think about it. Because if I say no, you argue with me. If I say yes, I'm in trouble again. So I say, I think about it. You know, there's some invitations I've been thinking about for years. <laughs> But I don't promise, so I get out of it. <laughs> so, so here, I made a promise, that was what I was going to do, and I did it. So all day, I was still fighting. And when it got to three o'clock, when you're fighting your thoughts, you get exhausted. And I was so exhausted, I went up to my room, my little hut, and I leant against the wall, put my feet out. And I thought, okay, any sexual fantasy, any romantic thought, anything, I'm not going to stop you at all, go for it. And for the next hour, my mind was so peaceful, it watched every breath with no effort at all. And that really just, really shocked me, but it taught me a very great lesson. The reason why I was, my mind was going crazy, I was trying to stop it. I was trying to force it and control it. I was actually saying to that monster, get out of here. You don't belong in my mind. I'm a monk, I don't want those type of thoughts. And that gave them power and strength and they get stronger and bigger and more of a problem. As soon as I said, welcome, welcome romantic thoughts. Maybe she's still out there somewhere. My <laughs> soulmate. <laughs> and as soon as I welcome that sort of stupid thought, it just went away. It had no power. And my mind was just so peaceful. And that taught me just how not to meditate. Don't try and control the mind. If you have those thoughts, you say, get out of here, you'll be thinking all retreat, and they will never stop. Welcome. Thank you for coming to visit me. And then you find, because you are kind, your mind is peaceful and you're still. The very cause for all that thinking, which is, please excuse me, there's unhappiness, running away, trying to escape from this moment by thoughts of fantasies, dreams, whatever. The mind just goes and searches for happiness anywhere, if it hasn't got happiness now. And so by saying, okay, whatever you want to do, I'm happy, it meant my mind became still. And that's really the key to overcoming thoughts. And Anything else which happens in your life, you know, you may get cancers, get out of here cancer, you don't belong in my throne room, my body. What happens? It gets worse. You're tensing up, you're struggling, you're stressing. Of course it's going to get worse. Oh, welcome, body's big enough. Especially with a brain tumour, that's two brains, most people have only got one. <laughs> And I say that to people and they laugh too, and they get it. All that negativity, that is causes things to get worse. You laugh, have a bit of fun, it disappears. It's weird, but it's true. So that's with thoughts. Anger eating monsters, absolutely brilliant. Your husband. Get out of here. <laughs> you don't belong. Oh, I don't like you coming back late. Your wife. Oh, you're always nagging, nagging. Stop nagging. Whenever you do get out of here, negativity, you find the problem gets much worse. Say, welcome husband, welcome wife. 
Thank you so much for nagging me. <laughs> and they said, what, what do you mean? Not only getting upset, no, I like you nagging me. You do like me nagging me. I'm not going to nag you then. See if, we, see if you like that. <laughs> anyway, here we go. I do not have such experience again. No one has experience again. Every moment is totally unique. You never have it again. Even some people say, I tell the same story again. I don't tell the same story. <laughs> it's slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth changes all the time. So I do not have such experience again, but I do see distinct spot of very bright light and sometimes a ball of fire. But they do not last more than eight seconds. Why? <laughs> because you disturb them. They would stay there if you didn't disturb them. Ajahn Chah's great simile, the still forest pool. When he used to put his mosquito net umbrella, the things the old forest monks in Thailand used to use, next to a lake, and he would sit there in the evening with his eyes open to watch the animals come out to play. Elephants, tigers, panthers, bears. Because they would come out to drink by the lake. But when they came out, they would look around. <laughs> they would sniff. Because if they could detect a human being, they'd be so afraid, they would run back into the forest and not come out even though they were thirsty. Because the most dangerous animal in the whole forest was not the bear, was not the tiger, was not the elephant, it was us. <laughs> Human beings, they're the most dangerous. And so if the elephant or the tiger smelt a human being or saw one or heard one, they would hide. So the only way they would come out, they would sniff, listen, and Ajahn Chah would sit perfectly still so still, so silent, that all those animals would not realize he was there. And then they'd go out and play and drink. And he said he had wonderful times watching the animals mess around in the lake, just like people watch Nature Channel these days and see all the antics of animals. And he could do that because he was so still they didn't realize there was someone there. He said sometimes, very rarely, he was so still, so quiet, that animals came out of the forest he'd never seen before. Rare and beautiful animals, which his parents and teachers had never told him about. They too came out, but only when he was very still, because they were so sensitive. If he just moved, was it? Wow. They would know and they wouldn't come out again for days. And that was his experience. And he used to explain that is what it's like with these lights. The elephants and the tigers, they come out. Only when you're so still, it's like they don't know you're watching. The lights, the nimitas, it's like you're not there. Then they come out and stay a while and play by the still forest pool, which is your mind. And if you're really still, then these amazing animals come out, the jhanas, to play. But if you say, wow, <laughs> they run away, they don't come out for years. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an incredible story because that Similarly, that really, really helped me. Because you can say be still, but what do you mean being still? I used to imagine myself, when these lights come up, I imagine myself like an Ajahn Chah sitting in the jungle, perfectly still. And I knew if I moved, they'd know and run away. And that gave me a nice sort of way of learning how to be still. And now even when jhana stuff comes out, shh, don't move. I can't even say don't move. 
and then amazing things happen. So that's why those lights disappear, it's because you moved, you did something. But it's still nice, you've got some lights. Dear Ajahn, if we are not to go for jhana, then why is this place called Jhana Grove? We said not to go for jhana. <laughs> It's Jhana Groove, not Grove. <laughs> and all the people here during the range retreat called them Jhana Groovies. <laughs> that was their official name, Jhana Groovies. You don't go for Jhana, you go for peace and stillness. And then Jhana comes. Jhana is not what you do. Jhana is what happens. I had this experience in one retreat. My mind was freezed. That's because they didn't have the aircon heater on. <laughs> <laughs> and my usual thinking mind stopped. I was scared, but I felt pure joy, bliss and happiness in my heart. I also see the breath like a child smiling at me. Oh, isn't that nice? Although sometimes children don't smile at you. You know there is a custom, you know, in Thai Buddhism, is actually when they give birth to a child, they offer it to the monk. It's almost like you know, being a godfather. And so they offer it to, the, to me sometimes, because I'm a senior monk. And they offer this kid to me, and look, look, I haven't had kids. And it's got a nappy on, and I've got to put it in my lap, and I get rid of it as soon as possible. Because <laughs> if they poo, it gets all into my robe. And I've got a stinky robe for the next day. It's okay for you, you can go and get changed, I've only got one robe. <laughs> So sometimes they say, a child is smiling at me. A child is smiling at me and I'm looking at their pants and say, make sure they don't. <laughs> Punks and kids, sometimes. I know, sometimes. You know, you see me, if those have been up, did the holy water. Most kids, they love being sprinkled with holy water. But every now and again, there's one who screams their head off. Mummy, he's soaking me with water and crying and screaming and it's like I've been abusing the kid. <laughs> and I feel really bad about that. <laughs> so I don't know about kids. Anyway, I also see the breath like a child smiling at me. Though it was a brief feeling but it lasted two hours. Great. Here's the breath I saw as a child, the nimitta and the joy of the jhana. Please let me know. Thanks. Okay, my mind was freezed, my usual thinking mind stopped, that's really good. You were scared, but obviously the scare didn't stop you. You know, you had enough momentum to go through the fear. A lot of time that is actually very common to get scary when you get to these deep states of mind, because number one, you haven't been there before. You think, what the heck's going on? But please, that's why I talk about this. It's no, nothing to be afraid of at all. I've been teaching meditation how many years? I've forgotten how many years and I've had no casualties yet. <laughs> I've got perfect record. And I don't want to stop that perfect record yet. You're going to be totally safe. So I don't need to be scared. Ajahn Brahm is here. You're fine. <laughs> so, you don't, but scare comes up, but one of the great ways to overcome that fear is you're letting go so much, it's so peaceful, it's so beautiful, you just you go straight through it. It's just too nice. The joy overpowers the fear. And anyway, so what exactly was it? It's, you need to give me more sort of um, information about that, but pure joy, bliss and happiness, that was almost like just uh, you know, a jhana, that's probably what it was. But you need to give me more information. And you also see the breath like a child smiling at me. That's like a nimitta. So it could be. But if it was, so what? It's not entertainment, you just let go. If you want it back again, you never get it. You've got to just let go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> some of the people who write this. <laughs> I get very windy whenever I meditate. And they call it a farty. <laughs> what should I do? Hold tight or let go? <laughs> <laughs> Number one, what you should do is please, out of compassion for others, sit in the back row. <laughs> so there's no one behind you. Okay, so 
Now I know all the windy people are the <laughs> ones who sit in the back. <laughs> so that no one will suffer from their condition. Okay. Very nice. Good to have a sense of humour. How do you overcome the guilty feeling? I only realise I stepped over an ant when I walk because I'm not mindful. I feel so bad afterwards. Oh. Guilty. You give yourself a fair trial. You know, in Singapore, in Australia, if you're accused of a crime, you get a trial. And in every trial, you have the prosecutor and also the defence. But when you feel guilty, all you ever have is a prosecutor. All the reasons why you should feel guilty. You killed an ant. That is really bad, especially in a nine-day retreat in a holy monastery. Now, maybe killing an ant in Singapore is another thing, but killing an ant in a monastery, that's double bad karma. And in a retreat when you're keeping precepts, it doubles again to quadruple bad karma. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what a prosecutor does. It sees the very worst um, motivation, intention, an outcome of whatever you do. That's what a prosecutor is supposed to do, to see the very worst side of it. And for many people, when they feel guilty, that's they stop there and the judge says, guilty. So if you are going to judge yourself, please be fair. Have a defence attorney there who tries to get you off the hook. And said, you know, well, you know, that was a great sacrifice of that ant. You know, because I'm on a retreat here, you know, and it got uh, squashed by me, that would probably get reborn in a good realm now. <laughs> and, you know, afterwards I'm going to share merits with that ant, and not many ants get merits shared <laughs> with them, so, I mean, they're very, very lucky. Imagine the luck of an ant getting squashed by someone like me. They're just so fortunate. <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, try... And anyway, so I just no, I wasn't sort of, you know, I didn't mean it. It was unintentional, just an accident, these things happen. And when you try and defend your actions by having a defence attorney or lawyer on your case, then you can convince yourself it wasn't that bad. Which means the guilt to say, you know, okay, not guilty. But a lot of times we're so negative to ourselves. We always want to prosecute ourselves. We always want to see the worst side of what we've done. That's why we feel guilty all the time. And you know, people come to me and they say, oh, this is what I did, I feel terrible, I'm a bad person. I say, no, you're not. You know, most people do. It's not a bad thing. You made a mistake. Nothing wrong with making a mistake in life. And no tree in a forest is straight up. And they're all bent. So you made a mistake. You learn from mistakes. Have any, ever, any one of you ever got 100% in an exam at school? You always make mistakes. Do you feel guilty? I made a mistake. I only got 99%. Oh, I'm terrible at maths. <laughs> That's crazy what you do. And also, if you do something wrong, one bad brick in the wall, and you want to destroy the wall. That's called guilt. So if you have a defence, <laughs> You defend yourself, you love yourself, you care for yourself, you stick up for yourself. And then a lot of times you say, no, I didn't do very bad, that's not bad. I always remember the story that there was one lady, she was dying of cancer, I was counselling her for a while, and you know, she eventually she died. And I remember asking her once, you know, in a counselling session, you know, what's the worst thing you've ever done in your life? Because it's really important to bring up the worst thing you've ever done in your life. And because you know, I, sh I developed trust with her, and you know, she sort of respected me, she said, well, it, it took, took a while to get it out of her, but she said the worst thing she'd ever done in her whole life was she was married and she kissed somebody else's husband. I said, is that it? I said, yeah, that's the worst thing I've ever done. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the worst thing you've done in your whole life, you know, you've been an amazing woman. You, have you done something worse than that? Come on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> done silly things, stupid things. But that's the worst thing she did. And you know, once she said that, 
and she brought it up to the surface and showed my reaction. She realized it wasn't so bad after all. But she'd been feeling guilty for that for such a long time because she didn't share it with other people and get some reaction. And once she got the reaction from me, and it was, she saw herself, it wasn't such a bad thing. You know, it was not a good thing to do, but you know, we all make mistakes. And that's the only mistake you've made in your life. That's pretty good. And so she died peacefully as a result, without that guilt. And that was an amazing thing to be able to do. You know what made me guilty? I wrote, this is in Good, Bad, Who Knows. What made me really guilty for a long time when I was a student, I was really poor, and my father had died, and my mum was really poor, living in a sort of government-subsidised housing, and she was supposed to give me some money to sort of look after me during, because she got some tax relief because I was still a student. But no way would I accept any money from my mother, so every vacation I got jobs. I had to pay my way through university, basically. And I got these jobs, and I got some stupid jobs sometimes, and I got the most stupid job in the whole world, selling encyclopedias door to door. It's great to do that job once, just so you can say you did it. And it was children's encyclopedias, totally rubbish. And you, know, you, you had to learn, you know, the, the marketing spiel, they called it. Just, you know, this few paragraphs, you know, you learnt it and repeated it in front of these young couples who just had a kid. And basically, you know, it convinced them that they were just only a little bit better than a child molester if they did not <laughs> sort of buy this amazing book, that they were depriving their kids of a good education and a life because this book was so important for them. And the worst thing I did was I actually sold one. And I felt so terrible afterwards, I went home afterwards, I actually sold one and made some money. And I just, I just resigned the next day, I just couldn't stand myself. Because you know, there's this little couple just starting off in life, lots of debts, a new kid in their family, and they had to waste you know, about ten pounds or something for this stupid encyclopedia. <laughs> and they probably would go without food. The kid will probably sort of be starving, and I had all these exaggerated thoughts, and I felt so disgusted with myself. And it's not just overnight, I kept thinking like that for years. And I remember once at our centre in Perth, I told that story about guilt, and I thought I'd tell terrible about that. But I was a poor student, it's just the best thing I could do. And afterwards, this young lady came up. She was just about the right age. Because she said, Ajahn Brahm, I listened to that story and this is absolutely ridiculous. It, you know, it's too much bigger coincidence, but I have to tell you this. When I was small, a young student came to our house in England with long hair and a beard and he sold my parents <laughs> this set of books. And I love those books. Those are my favourite books. I still love them. And that was just, that really sort of spanned me out. Could it be the same girl? <laughs> Probably was. That's the way karma works. And I thought I'd just sold these whole lot of useless books, you know, to this family, and actually they were beautiful and wonderful. And she told me just her favourite books in the whole world. And she said, Thank you. And that just changed my whole guilt all around. And I felt proud of that. I should have stayed on and sold some more books. <laughs> And sometimes, if you say what you've done, and sometimes you think it's a bad thing, it's actually not such a bad thing at all, maybe even a good thing. So don't feel guilty, it's a total waste of time. Is 3 to 4 p.m. Sutta sessions? No, 3 to 4 p.m. is sexy thought session. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not okay. No, we don't have Sutta sessions here for 3 to 4 p.m. Don't know where you got that idea from. Dear Ajahn, P.S. Could you go through in detail 16 stages in Dhamma talk? No. <laughs> I already went through those. Okay, I'm going to say briefly tomorrow because I was going to talk about breath meditation tomorrow. And how the four stages relate to the aggregates. Okay, body, perception, feeling, mind formation and consciousness. I recall you mentioned feeling at second stage and chitta at third stage. Okay, I'll have a go at that tomorrow morning. I feel like being a mother. 
Are you male or female? <laughs> well, this is modern age, the single sex families. Do they have single sex families in Singapore? Can so two men adopt a baby? Why not? I remember they had this debate over in Australia about sort of uh, same-sex marriages and you know, can, uh, say, two men adopt a child? And somebody said, you know, because there's many Christians on that panel, they said, well, you know, Jesus had two fathers and he turned out all right. <laughs> That was really such a clever comment. Because <laughs> he, he didn't have a mother, he was immaculately conceived. No mother, but two fathers, Joseph and God. <laughs> Three fathers? Who was his other father? Not the, the Holy Ghost or something. No, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you're gonna go. <laughs> They better not go there. I feel, <laughs> I feel like being a mother. Not sure if it's just hormones and an evolutionary trick or whether I would be happier with a little daughter. What about a little son? Sorry. But a little daughter, how to make sense of this, okay? See if you can look after somebody else's little daughter for a weekend. That will cure you. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's amazing. Other people's children are really cute. But when it's your own, <laughs> you have to live with it. Sometimes you get a bit fed up. Getting up in the middle of the night. So often you just go to sleep. Rah, rah, rah. That's a, it's a lot of time, energy, investment and money having a kid. How about having a dog instead? A dog is so easy, you don't have to pay for their education. You don't have to, you know, to worry that they pass all those exams, you know, so they go to the fast dream in Singapore. And they don't have to do national service. And, you know, you can, if you want to go overseas, you know, to England on holiday, you don't have to worry about what you're going to do with your kid. You just put them in a kennel, and they're happy as ever. And, you know, they never get into trouble at school. So, why not have a dog? And they're affectionate. So having a dog is much better than having a kid, that's what I say. <laughs> I jam, bro, you're a monk, you don't understand. Yeah, quite right. <laughs> but anyway, you know, sometimes we feel like these things. But you know, sometimes just you wait and see, see if it stays like that. And if it stays a long time, then fair enough. But you know, if you, sometimes these things come and they go, they pass. But remember that always see, see both sides. You know, there's many advantages of having a child, but you don't have to have one if you don't want one. Don't feel pressurized by society as well. That's one amazing thing in our modern world, and especially for women, that you don't have to get married. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's accepted these days. You know, about 30 years ago, if you weren't married, they think there's something very wrong with you. Either you're ugly, or that you know, you're lesbian, or there's some of you are crazy, you know, that you haven't got married. And so I really felt for women who just wanted to be single you know, 30, 40 years ago, but they just couldn't do it, society wouldn't accept it. So they married, they never really wanted to get married, but they had to. And that's really nasty. Now you have that freedom, you can be single if you want to, and have a wonderful life. You have choice. The same with having children. You know, sometimes your parents, you know, they keep on at you. When are you going to have a kid? You, know, you should have a child. We want, I want grandchildren. And there's so much pressure on their children. Never do that. You know, because, yeah, you know, the par grandparents get to play with the, the kids, the grandkids, but they don't have to do all the hard work looking after them. So it's really a bit selfish of grandchildren, of grandparents, to say that to their, their, um, their children to have kids. So stand your ground. If you don't want one, don't have one. There's many advantages. So anyway, 
the Ajahn Brahm, why are Buddhists more forgiving to people of other religions than their own fellow Buddhists? Ha ha ha, that's a good question. Why are Buddhists more forgiving to other religions than they are to their fellow Buddhists? And there is another story, I, I put this in one book, but it's a great story. It's, a, it's like a joke, but it's a good story. So this man was walking home from church one day. It's a Christian story, because it works with Christian stories. He was coming home from church one day, and he saw a man standing on the bridge, about to jump off and commit suicide. And so he's, you know, he was a Christian, so he said, please sir, don't jump off. You know, I'm a Christian, you know, I can help you. And the man was about to jump off, you're a Christian? He said, I'm a Christian too. What denomination? And the guy walking on the bridge said, I'm a Baptist. Amazing, said the guy about to commit suicide, I'm a Baptist too. And he said, now what type of Baptist? Southern or Northern Baptist? And the guy sort of uh, on the bridge about to jump off said, I'm a Southern Baptist, what about you? Me too, Southern Baptist. And are you Southern Baptist of the 1928 reform or the Orthodox Southern Baptist? And the guy on the, the, uh, the bridge said, no, I'm a Reformed Southern Baptist. And a guy about to jump off said, I'm an Orthodox, uh, I'm an Orthodox uh, Baptist. And the guy on the bridge, jump off, jump off, you, you, you renegade. <laughs> <laughs> we get more angry at the people who are closest to us. Philosophically, religiously, and also just in marriage as well. You're so close together, that's why you get angry at each other. And you find that the arguments you have within a religion, especially if it's your particular sect of a religion, Theravada. Theravada, forest tradition or village? Forest tradition. Forest tradition, uh, Wat Pa Pong tradition, or other traditions, Wat Pa Pong tradition. <laughs> you ordained bhikkhunis? But I didn't ordain bhikkhunis. Get out of here, you heretic. <laughs> The closer you are, the more fiction it is. And that's actually why it happens. You, you know, see the, even the, the Christians or the Muslims murdering each other in Iraq. Muslims against Muslims. You know, it is a bad story. It's a bit of a joke, but here we go. <laughs> <laughs> You know there's very many, many Muslims over in UK, especially around places like Bradford and Birmingham. So they decided around that area to actually to adapt to the local culture, which was mostly Muslim, when they did the weather forecast. So the weather forecast around Bradford today, most not a little bit sunny, but mostly shy. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> don't tell that in Singapore, <laughs> otherwise you get your head cut off. <laughs> at the point of death. At the point of death, is pain is felt when organs are being removed, would that affect the consciousness and hence the rebirth? You always have a little bit of... What about when you give birth? Is that painful? Is it worth it? Of course it's worth it. Even sometimes when you have your tooth taken out, it's a bit painful, but it's worth it. You know, even like you're working hard, sometimes when you're working hard, building or even cooking, you know, you're tired, but it's worth it. So the little bit of pain, you know, if there is a bit of pain, when your organs are taken out, it's worth it. Because whatever discomfort you do feel, which is probably none at all, is balanced by the fact that you're doing this amazing good karma. Amazing good karma, you're actually giving an organ to someone who really needs it. You can't use it anymore. And you know that some people think, and it's crazy thoughts, if you give, say, you know, your stomach, you know, or your, your heart to someone, when you go to heaven you won't have a heart, you won't have a stomach. So you have to be hungry for the rest of eternity. You know, some stupid people think like that. They think that they're going to need their heart when they go to heaven. If you give your eyes to someone when you die, 
When you go to heaven, you'll get ten eyes or four eyes or whatever. <laughs> more eyes than you've ever had before. You never lose by being kind and being generous. You always get it back many times over. And that's why it's beautiful acts of kindness. One little story about this little boy. It was in the newspapers here in Perth. He was riding home from school on a BMX bike, which is you know, really quite valuable. His parents had got it for a birthday present for him. Riding home from school, he passed a couple of bikes of boys bigger than him, maybe two years bigger than him, who had caught a rabbit in a, like a little reserve, a little bit of parkland in Perth, and they were mistreating it. So this little kid stopped and said to those bigger boys, leave the poor rabbit alone, stop hurting it. And the boys said, get away, go away. They didn't actually say that, but it was worse to the same effect. They swore at him. And so this little kid, he couldn't fight the bigger boy, so he said, look, I'll give you my bike if you give me the rabbit. And the two elder boys, you know, it's an expensive bike, and they could always catch another rabbit, so they gave him the rabbit and took his bike. And, you know, I think he took the rabbit home or released it, you know, so it was safe. And he walked home, and his mum said, where's your bike? When he told what had happened, she was so impressed that she knew someone who was in the newspaper. She thought, this is a beautiful story. Someone had saved a rabbit. And so the next morning, it was on the front page of our local newspaper, the West Australian. And it was a good news story. A kid, you know, was caring for an animal so much, he sacrificed his own bike. And the next day, he was in the front page of the newspaper again, with three BMX bikes, which had been donated to him <laughs> by people who read the article. We, we want to support this bike shops and individual people think, yeah, we want to reward that kid. So he sacrificed one bike, but he got three back. And that is how the world happens, works. So, you know, if something, if something happens like that, if uh, uh, you give your organs, if you give one, you get many back. <laughs> so please don't give your mouth. <laughs> Otherwise, in your next life, you know, oh, I'd be terrible having two mouths, three mouths. Whoever has to live you will really suffer. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Bhav, some people who, want, who went to Myanmar, even in something for retreats, I can't remember, Sang Pine for retreats, claimed they have attained, oh yeah, claimed they have attained second and third jhana. However, I don't see much difference in them. They're still in the same jobs and they're still upset by the same things. Please comment. Now this is called spiritual materialism. Now that we know that jhanas are important, people want to get them. And so some people come to Ajahn Brahm to get jhanas. And you know, I have such high standards. And even if you do get a jhana, I usually say, well, maybe it is, maybe it's not and I don't confirm it. But other people, and so they come here and say, it's a waste of time coming to Ajahn Brahm. They go to another teacher who says, yeah, you had some happiness, that's first jhana. Yeah, that's second jhana. And they love that because the standards are very low, so they can get... <laughs> <laughs> and they're missing out, it's not the purpose, that's spiritual materialism. So you go to your friends and say, I went to Myanmar, I got second jhana. You went to Jhana Grove, what did you get? Hungry? <laughs> so you can see that, you know, it's just what upmanship. If you do attain things, you don't tell anyone. How, how many years you've been trying to get it out of me, Angie? For years you've been trying to squeeze this secrets out of me, and you don't tell anybody because there's a reason for that. That's just spiritual materialism. So any, and we don't even call them attainments. These are what you lose. And you don't attain things, you free yourself from things. So jhanas are just stages of letting go, stages of freedom. Everything is falling away and you're free and that's the happiness. So it's not something you attain. It's something which happens when you let go. And which means that you can never go to a place to get jhanas. 
You come here, you let go of a lot of rubbish, and then all you've got left is the jhana. That's how it works. So when they say that they've attained these things like that, then that is so sus, so sort of doubtful, that I wouldn't give it much credence at all. You have to see them first of all, but that doesn't make any sense to me. And if you do get a jhana, you know, you just can't get irritated. It's impossible. For weeks afterwards, you're just so high, you're blissed out. You know, nothing bothers you at all. But someone says, you stupid Asian. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, can't, they can't irritate you. And that's why, that's one of the reasons, that's why as a teacher, you know, if someone says it, I, it doesn't matter what they say, I look at their face, I look at their emotions. And if they had a jhana, it literally is written all over their face, they're sort of goo goo ga <laughs> And, you know, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, and you just can't irritate them. You know, you can say stupid things, and sometimes you try and test them to try and make them irritated. You know, and they're just, they're just sitting there, just happy. They can't get irritated. It's okay, that could have been a jhana. How do we encourage true love in our intimate relationship with our partner, rather than just grasping? Clinging ego attachment we call love, but it's not love at all. Love, what is love is, your whole purpose in life is the other person is happy. You just want them to be happy, just like you love a child. Now when you have a child, you just want them to be happy. You know, maybe even if they go overseas and live somewhere else, as long as they're happy, their mum and dad are happy. You'd rather have them next door. But the most important thing is your kids are happy and well. And that's the greatest gift a child can give their parents, that they're happy. It makes mum and dad really, really content. So it's the same, that's like true love. So if you really, really love your partner, you just want them to be happy. And the test is this. This is my test to see whether your relationship is true love or whether it's grasping. And the test is this. You come on retreat and your partner is back in Singapore. And when you go home, you find there's a message waiting for you. That your partner, say it's your husband, has run away with your best friend. And is having a wonderful time in Phuket <laughs> with lots of sex, with lots of romance, how do you feel? Do you get angry and upset? He's run away with my best friend! How can he do that to me? Or do you feel, oh, I'm so happy. He's having such a wonderful time in Phuket with my best friend, that he's having better sex with him or her than he ever had with me. Oh, that makes me so happy to know that he's having a good time. Can you do that? <laughs> That's why your love is grasping. It's not real love. Real love is their happiness is the only thing for you. They just want them to be happy. Sometimes you do see that when people die. You know, the husband or the wife turns to their partner who's dying. Or rather, the partner who's dying turns to their partner and says, Darling, look, you know, just, it's okay that to find another partner in life once I'm gone. You know, you're still young, you know, you're still attractive, at least to me you are, says the one who's dying. You know, don't feel guilty to go without with another man and have another relationship, please. That's beautiful what I've seen that. Maybe you've seen that. It's wonderful you see the person, yeah, I love you, but I want you to be happy. You know, please go on. Find another partner when I'm gone. Because I really want you to be happy. And that's a sign that they really love their partner. And it really frees the other partner as well, because a lot of time, you know, if you've been married and your partner dies suddenly, and you're still young, and you think, should I get married again? But you feel like that's unfaithful to the, your first partner who passed away. But your first partner gives you permission, and that makes it so much easier to have another relationship, and have, you know, some people need that, and have another <laughs> fulfilling partner in life. So that's like love, that's letting go. <laughs> Do Ajahn, I get agitated or can raise my voice if I see things going the wrong way. And especially with kids choosing to do things that are not useful in their lives. Such agitation affects my meditation. How does one really let go? Okay, sometimes kids have to go the wrong way. My grandma got irritated at me for going to Thailand, becoming a monk. 
She thought I was going the wrong way. I was wasting my education. So she got agitated. Did she get agitated for a good cause? Sometimes kids have to go their way. You don't know where they're going to end up. So when you see someone else going what you think is a wrong way, you should remember, and no one's wearing the t-shirt today. Good? Bad? Who knows? <coughs> when you think like that, you don't know if it's a wrong way. And sometimes the kids have to get hurt in order for them to learn. So just, if you can, help, help. If you can't help, you just have to let go. After the peace, oh, after emerging from the peaceful meditation, the mind becomes more agitated, restlessness. How to, how to deal with the situation? Maybe you're coming out too fast and coming out too harshly. So when you come out of meditation, especially a deep meditation, don't just sort of get up and just go and have lunch or just go and uh, walk fast. Come out gently. So if you just had a deep meditation, open your eyes and just sit here for a few minutes. Just to allow the mind to sort of start uh, <coughs> adapting. Even do a bit of walking meditation and then go and take a rest. Because sometimes if you come out too fast, the mind is agitated. Ajahn Chah used to say it's like pouring hot water in a cold glass. You, know, you come out too fast. So come out slowly, and then you can actually take the peace in meditation. You can take it out of this hall into your life with you, instead of being agitated. Jhana is not mentioned in Satipatthana Sutta, but in M, the 119, the Kaigati Sutta, uh, is Satipatthana's summary only, need to be read with other suttas, complete understanding. Jhana is not mentioned in Satipatthana Sutta. Yes, it is. In the contemplation of the Dhammas. One of those contemplations is Eightfold Path. And the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path is Jhana. It's always Jhana. So it's actually it's in there. And also in the Satipatthana Samyutta. In the Sutta of the Cook, Michel, the Cook. If you're going to be successful as a cook, you know, what you do is you make your food and you ask people and you see what gets taken. You know, some dishes, it's totally finished before even the last person can actually you know, get their share. And other dishes remain. Then you get to learn you know, what actually people like. And that becomes a wise cook. And they say, the simile of the wise cook is the same as the simile of the wise meditator. You're doing satipatthana, but once you start to get a bit dull, then you go into the jhanas. And then you get energized. And once you get energized, then you can come out and do more satipatthanas. So he said, that's a wise meditator in the simile of the cook. So you don't just do satipatthana, because if you go contemplating, 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 you get tired after a while. So you need to boost the energies and the clarity of your mind. And then you become a wise cook and always welcome back to Jhana Grove. And they not only say that, they also say, and this is a nice little bit for Michelle, okay, you, know, you get some pay, but if you really, really, really want her to be back here again, you give her a bit of tips. Like in good restaurants in Singapore, do you give tips? Do you? No! <laughs> you mean and stingy Singaporeans. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> but it's nice to give a little bit extra every now and again, if you enjoy the food. And that means, you know, it's nice encouraging people. Besides following the Dharma meditation, doing good deeds, what can we do to attain enlightenment faster? <laughs> Be patient. <laughs> What do you want to get there faster for? Those who want to get there faster end up getting there slower. That's the problem. Shortcuts. <laughs> How many of you have been on a shortcut and got totally lost? That's the trouble these days. People want the shortcut, the fast way to be rich. 
I will tell you the fast way to be rich. Work hard, spend little. <laughs> it's obvious to me. But people, no, 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 no. They want to work little and spend a lot <laughs> and expect to be rich. It's crazy people. So this is, don't take the shortcut. Take the well-worn path. There is a reason why it's a well-worn path. It is because it's the one which works. And don't think that you are different, I am smarter, I can sort of outwit everybody else. That's also the problem with, uh, with gambling. Why do people gamble? Go to casinos because they are so conceited that they think they're better than everybody else and will beat the system. And it's just conceit. Thinks, I've got a system. I've got some extra so I can win. But, you know, just anyone who's done maths knows you don't win. The odds are always against you. You go to a casino and you see who pays all those salaries for all those workers? Who pays for all those glittering lights? The stupid gamblers, you pay for it. So, you know, the casino is not a charity. It's not they're giving out money. It's taking money. The, the only reason people go there is because they are conceited. They think they can win. That they've got a secret which no one else has. It's the same with some people think, I can do it fast. Because I'm much better than everybody else. It's much better to be humble and take the well-worn path. That's the one which works. I experienced a beautiful breath and saw the very bright light and I followed your instructions and said to myself, this is good enough. The bright life suddenly enveloped me in my mind. Woohoo! It is very peaceful. Yes! I was aware of my body but I cannot move or give instructions to my hands and legs to move. It is strange. Does the body belong to me if I cannot control its movement? Of course it doesn't belong to you. If it doesn't belong to me, what is me then? Exactly. You aren't. Very good. So all these experiences in deep meditation, they show you what you thought you were, you aren't. It's just an illusion. You get more data in meditation, and after you get a lot of data like that, you find all these things I thought I was aren't true. There's no one in here. Freedom at last. Peace at last. To know I'm totally irresponsible. You can call me an idiot, you can call me stupid, and I look inside, who are they talking about? Not me, no one in here. Isn't it nice not to have anyone in here? The Ajahn, is there a difference between staring at an object, staring at an object blankly with no thoughts versus meditation, thank you. Yet yeah, a corpse can stare at an object blankly, but a live person, when they stare at an object in meditation, they have happiness. That is the difference. The happiness which comes when you just stay still for a long time. Ah, another one with a... Oh, what cracky, what is this? This is typed out, so someone is using a computer when they shouldn't be. Is there a cut-off point, a threshold of complexity, in an integrated system of information that would allow a stream of consciousness to enter. And where does it enter? Can there be two? I think they're calling about artificial intelligence, maybe. If rebirth is cause and effect, then why do the memories and experience of a being get remembered? If it's not a being, but a process. What makes all these candors somehow attached? Delusion, is it simply the breaking of delusion that makes the process dissipate and the cause effect broken? It is hard to bridge the gap between the understanding we have about the mind and consciousness through the scientific method and the teachings of the Buddha. It's hard actually to understand what this question is about. So please keep the question simple. <laughs> truth is truth and should be accessed to any method of investigation. Please help bridge this gap. Okay, the scientific method is gathering data, first of all. Not just theories, but doing experiments, gathering the data with an open mind, that's why we meditate, to gather the data of what is consciousness, what is mind, 
what is knowing. And that's precisely the purpose of meditation, to give you that data. This thing called mind, what is it? It is so caught up with other stuff. I developed the simile of the emperor. The emperor, whenever the emperor comes out into public, the emperor is always wearing five pieces of clothing. The boots, trousers, jacket, gloves and helmet. And they all overlap each other, so you can't see any skin. No eyes, no features, so you don't know whether the emperor is male or female, African, Chinese, Ang Mo, you don't know what they are, old or young, because you can never see them underneath these five pieces of clothing. And the only way to find out what this emperor is, which is so powerful, is to take the five pieces of clothing off. So there's just the emperor, and then you can find out their nature. And that's a simile for the mind and the five senses. Your mind is covered with overlapping five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and physical touch, and they're always there, so you have no idea what's underneath them all. The mind. And the job of meditation is to calm down the five senses so much, they disappear. To all that's left is mind, the sixth sense. You know, it's weird in modern science, there are only five senses. That's absolutely ridiculous. Totally um, against all information. Not supported by facts, by evidence. The idea we only have five senses. So when you take those five senses off, and you're not, you're not seeing anything, you're not hearing, you're not smelling, you're not tasting, you're not touching, but you're perfectly alive, <coughs> mindful, aware. That's called jhanas. Now, with that date, with that experience, you have an understanding of what this mind truly is, what, what we call the stream of consciousness, and why we call it a stream of consciousness, and why it can connect with previous streams of consciousness. As I mentioned before, sometimes when you just come out of the jhanas, but your mind is still very powerful, what is my earliest memory? You go back to past lives. And they're real. You ask anyone who's experienced their past lives, this is not imagination, this is true. And they get facts. They get details, names and places. They check them out. And they're real. So scientifically, reincarnation has been proven. And anyone who says otherwise is not a legitimate scientist. I say that because I know what science is. I was trained as a scientist. You've got to put aside all of your views, no matter what they are, and face the facts. This is true. But how does it work? How does gravity work? No one, no scientist understands how gravity works, but they know it exists. And you get even, even in more interesting stuff. Quantum entanglement, where the effects so, you know, where the cause comes after the effect. Backward causality, proven at last. We always think the cause has to come before the effect in time. Quantum entanglement has totally disproved that. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical, but it is true. It owns it because it's our logic is not right. This is true, proven. Something happens and it changes things which occurred beforehand. Quantum entanglement. So this is why that people who say things like reincarnation isn't scientific, they just do not know their science. They're following views rather than evidence. Da, 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 da. That's your brother. Thank you for your ever patience with us. Oh yeah, it's just... All these years with the BF from the <laughs> <laughs> No, it's good fun. Is there two methods of practicing Anapanasati? One method as per Satipatthana, only four steps, another six steps of Anapanasati Sutta. I will do the breath tomorrow, so just hold your breath. It will all be explained tomorrow. Ajahn may I know how a practitioner can help a non-practitioner in their last moment? 
Thank you for your kindness. Most people have fear and worry. How can you help someone who's dying? Yes, ask them if they... Do you believe in heaven? Or do you think there's nothing afterwards? If they believe there's nothing afterwards, what are you going to worry about? You're soon going to disappear. So what are you worried about? If they believe there's heaven afterwards, great, I know a few monks who can sort of uh, put a few strings for you. <laughs> a bit of chanting, <laughs> send you up to heaven. So either way, you're going to be okay. But one of the things is always make them laugh. Don't take life and death too seriously. Crikey. That's what, uh, there was this soccer manager in England. Does anyone support Liverpool? Bill Shankly, his name was. And somebody once said, you know, people are taking this sport so seriously. And he sort of had to stand up and say, look, someone think that soccer is a matter of life and death. They're wrong. It's much more important than that. <laughs> <laughs> He's famous for that. <laughs> and for many people in sport, it is more important. But anyway, when I see my body is not right, I can seek medical help. But when I see my mind is not right, like having sexual fantasy, what can I do? You seek Ajahn Brahm help. <laughs> I know that both body and mind are not me, but I don't like that mind. I need to do something. Help. So this is when your body is sick, you go to the hospital. When your mind is sick, you come to the temple. That must be why you've all come to the retreat. You're all sick in the head. <laughs> what is rise with gusto mean? <laughs> That's, I do everything with gusto. In other words, put some energy into getting up. Don't just wake up in the morning, oh God, four o'clock. And I'm on my vacation, what am I doing? It's stupid, I should be on some... Five o'clock still, six o'clock, I don't want to go stupid chanting, and I don't want to get up. Now that's rising without gusto. Rising with gusto is, you wake up in the morning, you jump up out of bed. zippity doo da! another wonderful day at Jana Grove, yes, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu! Hey, look at your clock, two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and all your neighbours banging your door, shut up! <laughs> no, it just means put some energy into whatever you do. <laughs> no, that, I give talks with gusto. Whatever I do, I try to put some energy into it. And when I meditate, I meditate with gusto. Gusto means just some energy, some oomph into your life. Otherwise, you just get depressed. Four o'clock, no, I don't want to get up. Five o'clock, I uh, don't want to get up. And this is in the afternoon. Six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Depressed. Why is it so hard to let go of attachments, even though at a conscious level I know I should let go? It's because you can't see what's doing the attaching. You don't know where the connection is. And the connection's not out there, it's in here. It's okay to let go of things out there, but who's doing the attaching? So once you see non-self, there's no one in here, there's no one to do the attaching, it's easy to let go. If you can't see that, or until you see that, it's impossible to let go, except for a short time. Lastly, for the 5 p.m. tea break, those who can't take cheese or chocolate, can they please replace it with things like biscuits, <laughs> or dim sum, <laughs> or... No, I, I, I did that. <laughs> if you can't take cheese, then take nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing is better than dumplings. <laughs> now don't worry about it, you know. You, at the very least, you're going to lose some weight. Look at me, I've been on fight eight, eight presets for 40 years. <laughs> they're going to be healthy, just don't worry about food. Because when you don't eat in the afternoon or evening, it means you really appreciate all of Michelle's hard work cooking. She puts so much effort and love into the breakfast and the lunches. 
So imagine you have lots to eat in the evening, like too many biscuits. You're not going to appreciate the food in the morning. So just, you know, just don't worry about it. And then when you don't think about it, there's no problem at all. So it's only a small thing, don't worry about it. Okay, so that is the talk for this evening. And I went on a bit longer, so please tomorrow, one person, one question. Okay, and don't bother somebody else's question. Can I have yours, please? Because you don't put it in <laughs> <laughs> And keep it simple. Okay, here we go. Zzz.